What's so special about the LS? How many times have you heard the term LS swap? What is it that makes the LS so popular with drag racers, hot rodders and drifters alike? There has to be a reason this particular engine is so many people's favourite. So let's strip it down and take a look. Back in January 1995, the LS was introduced as a clean sheet design by Chevrolet. And since then, the LS series of engines has been a firm favourite performance engine in OEM applications and as the ever popular LS swap. While Chev certainly didn't invent the V8 engine, the classic small block Chev was and still is such a popular engine that the brand's almost synonymous with the term V8. Chev took the literal decades of knowledge learned in producing the small block Chev and applied that to the LS. However, there wasn't much carried over from the old V8 to the new. Basically, rod bearings, lifters and bore spacing are about the only things the two engines have in common. Unlike Ford's long and tall Barra engine that we did a What's So Special on a little while back, the LS is a relatively small and relatively light engine. This is because of the old school pushrod design. Most modern performance engines utilise an overhead camshaft design which can certainly help the engine breathe, however it does add extra height, weight and complexity, especially when the engine's in a V configuration. If we take a look at something like Ford's Coyote engine, uh, or even Toyota's 1UZ, the top of the LS is a way more compact design. This is the reason why they're so popular for engine conversions, because they fit in practically anything. The LS was first introduced in the 1997 Corvette, and since then, GM's been shoving them in every vehicle they could find from trucks to Camaros and everything in between, including our Australian Holden Commodore. That means there's plenty to go around. They're not that expensive, but the price is on the rise, and there's a whole lot of after sales support for them. So what should you be looking for when you're buying your LS engine? Well, not that much to be honest. Uh, lifter problems seem to be reasonably common and are normally seen in older engines or engines with a high lift camshaft or engines that have been absolutely thrashed without regular servicing. If you hear an odd top end knock mixed with a weird squeak, the engine's gonna need attention. Check the oil pressure first, make sure it's got some. If it has got oil pressure, odds are the engine's just gonna need a set of lifters, but get onto this quickly. That noise is metal on metal carnage and it will be doing damage. Should you get one? Well, the answer is absolutely. If you wanna make some good power, good torque, and fit in just about any engine bay, you really can't go past the LS. Sure, you'll cop a few not another LS swap comments, but hey, your car will be running and theirs probably won't be. Which variant should you use? Well, it all depends on what you can get your hands on. All variants of the LS are a really good option. Lower the Ks, the better. There's huge aftermarket support for the LS series, and most parts like cranks, rods, pistons, camshafts, stud kits, and gaskets are available off the shelf and overnight. Now once you've selected the type of LS that you're going to be using, it's mounted in your project, you're going to need engine management, and that's where we can help. Haltech have gone to a huge amount of trouble to make a whole bunch of terminated harness kits to suit LS1 variants, LS2 variants, cable style throttle, electronic style throttles, so we've done all the hard work so you don't have to. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Firstly the Elite 2500 series ECU. So this is the unit, this is the brains of the operation. This is the one that'll do sequential injection, so it'll fire eight injectors individually. It'll do direct fire ignition, meaning it fires each coil individually. You can make advantage of your factory idle motor or an electronic throttle body, and works with all of your factory sensors, including your knock sensors. Next, the LS terminated engine harness. Don't worry, I know it looks scary. Everything's labeled, it's all pretty straightforward. In addition to the factory sensors on the LS, one of the things that I really like to add is a dual channel wide band controller. That looks like this. And what happens here, it's another one of our CAN expansion systems. So this is supplied with a cable that plugs straight from here 
into the same port that we use for a dash or a thermocouple system, something like that. And we do make little double adapters so you can plug a whole bunch of stuff in at once. Then it's simply got two cable links that we call flying lead. So an LSU 4.9 oxygen sensor would plug into each side, then would go into each exhaust system. So one for bank one, one for bank two. That way you can do banked O2 corrections and you can make sure that each side of the engine is running equally. We have done a video before of a full wire up of how to put a terminated engine harness across onto an LS. So I'll put that link in the comments below so you can have a bit of a look through that. I'm not gonna be doing that again today. Instead, I wanna get into it and I wanna pull this thing down and see what's so magic about it. Now we're at the fun bit where I get to pull this LS apart. Uh, thanks very much to our mates at Warspeed who've donated the engine. Um, it did come into the shop for a rebuild anyway, so I'll be stripping it down. Admittedly, I've already pulled a heap of stuff already off it and cleaned everything and then put it back together for the video today just so that I don't drip oil all over the place and so that you guys can see it all happen a little bit faster. Um, this is an LS1 cable throttle variant of the engine. So what I plan on doing is pulling everything apart bit by bit, having a bit of a look. Uh, we'll get all the way down to the bottom, hopefully in through the timing cover case and see what's inside. First bit, pretty straightforward. We'll just take the throttle body off and the intake manifold. So we've just taken the throttle body off. Uh, one of the things I did want to show you in case you're sort of not aware of it, when you're pressing the throttle in your car, a cable pulls on this, which in turn opens this valve which in turn lets more or less air into the engine. And that's how we regulate the engine's power. Once we've opened the throttle, the air goes in through the inlet manifold and then gets directed down to each of the eight cylinders on this V8. We've got eight injectors, one injector per cylinder that fires straight down into the inlet port. And we've got our fuel rails sitting on top that supply fuel at a base fuel pressure of 40 or 50 or 60 pounds of pressure into the backside of the injector and then the engine management system pulses that injector to spray certain amounts of fuel into the engine. The beauty of the LS engine is that a lot of this stuff is modular. So at the moment we've got our throttle position sensor and our idle air control motor housed in one unit here. So we don't need to do any extra mounting work there to remote mount anything. We've got our manifold pressure sensor hanging off the back of the inlet manifold. Already done, nice and easy. It's got our fuel rails over the top this engine is a returnless style fuel system, so it's got a fuel dampener up the top here. Don't be confused and think it's a fuel pressure regulator. It's a dampener. We've got our feed into the rails, and then we've just got a valve at the front here that's used sometimes to check fuel pressure. We can see all of our inlet ports, our two cylinder heads, our valley cover down the middle here. We've got a cam sensor, our oil pressure sensor, and our two knock sensors. So I'll pop those knock sensors out. So that's what the two knock sensors look like. They also hold the valley cover down as well as a whole bunch of bolts. Pop that off. Now that the inlet manifold and the valley cover are off, we can look down inside where the knock sensor mounted. Uh, you can actually see the single camshaft right down the bottom here. Bit unusual for us overhead cam guys to see a single camshaft down the bottom of the engine. We've got the cam gear across the front here. And um, we've actually got our cam center sink on the back side here. So we'll keep stripping the thing down and we will eventually get to the camshaft, but it is interesting to see that not mounted in the cylinder head where an overhead cam is. Okay, next we'll pop the rocker covers off. We'll pull the cylinder heads off. I'll clean up the workbench a little bit so we can keep moving things down the line. Now's probably a good time to point out all these witness marks on the cylinder heads where the intake manifold's been bolted on. Down the bottom, we can see the gasket where it's kind of sealed and everything's cool. Up the top here, you can actually see the marks where this thing, what, what they call match porting, is where you would use a grinder and grind out this shape so that the inlet manifold going in is the same size as the inlet port. So I don't know in this particular engine whether it's actually worth it or necessary to do, but if you hear someone talking about match porting the cylinder head to the intake manifold, that's what they're talking about. With the rocker cover pulled off, what we can see here, we can see all of our rockers along the top, we can see our valve springs, we can see our valve spring retainers, we can see the valve stem down the middle there. 
Uh, we can see the push rod, we'll get to those in a sec. Down the middle we can see the single camshaft, but we're missing a whole bunch of valves. On this side of the engine, per cylinder, there's only two valves. So on our late model high-tech stuff, we talk about four valves per cylinder, and that's high revving, high-tech, huge horsepower, all that stuff. Mate, this thing's got a single camshaft, and it's got two valves per cylinder, and it's got push rods, and it makes bulk horsepower. It just goes to show you don't need to reinvent everything. This thing works. Have a go at this thing. So that's a push rod. What happens here is that we've got a camshaft that's running down the center of an engine. We've got a hydraulic lifter, a thing that basically buffers between the camshaft and this thing. It sits in front of the engine here. As the camshaft spins around, push rod goes up and down. Then, presses on this thing, the rocker, which in turn then presses up and down on the top of the valve spring, compress, uh, sorry, up on top, of the, on top of the valve, compresses the valve spring, pushes the valve down, and that's how we get our valve timing. So keep in mind, we've normally got one push rod per valve, per valve spring and per rocker arm, but in this particular case, I've already taken all the push rods out simply because I wanted to spin the engine over and I didn't want to have to act against all the valve springs. In a normal case, you certainly wouldn't be doing this. So now that we've got the cylinder head on the bench, we can see that we've got our intake port. And if we look down in through the intake port, you can actually see the inlet valve, which is mated to this valve spring and this valve retainer. On the exhaust side, we've got this one, another exhaust valve. You can put your finger here and you can actually feel the exhaust valve on the inside of the cylinder head. And then this is the exhaust port. Let's now pick it up and we'll flip her over. <coughs> on the bottom of the cylinder head, we can see that we've got our four cylinders on this bank of the V8. We've got our exhaust valve, which is the smaller valve. We've got our intake valve, which is the bigger one. We've got our head gasket mating surface. And we've also got a thread directly into each cylinder. That's for the spark plug. So if you've heard any of your mates talking about a head gasket or more importantly, a blown head gasket, what a head gasket is, is this thing. So this is a multi-layered gasket. I don't know whether we can get that in there. And basically what this thing does we plonk that down, put our cylinder head on top. We, we torque it down with head studs or head bolts. And it seals the compression from each cylinder onto the cylinder head, as well as sealing these galleries that come through the top to allow water and oil to get up into the cylinder head and then also to drain back out into the engine. So it is a gasket, it's just a really important gasket. The next step is pretty similar. We're just gonna pull this other cylinder head off. Everything looks about the same as the other side, just mirror imaged, but I'm just gonna pull it off so it makes the thing easier to turn over on the, uh, on the engine stand so we can have a look at the bottom end. Now that the thing's flipped over, we'll pull the sump off and we'll get a better look at the big ends and mains and what's going on underneath. While we're here though, the harmonic balancer, some of you guys might have noticed it's sticking out a little bit further than normal. That's because I spent all morning with a puller getting the thing off. Uh, surprisingly difficult if you are gonna try and pull the harmonic balancer off one of these things, make sure that you've got the right tool to pull the thing off. So our one is super easy like that, but it did take us a while to get there. Here we go, that's the sump off. One of the things you will notice here, so this is the oil pickup, comes from the oil pump that's crank driven. The oil pickup sits down in this hole, so nobody's baffled in there quite nicely. So the next step is we'll pull the oil pickup. It's 
pretty straightforward. So that's got like a gauze in there that stops it from picking up ginormous chunks of stuff. But the reality is if you've got stuff in your metal, like in your sump that's that big, you've got bigger problems anyway. There's an O-ring here that seats in the bottom of the oil pump and we will be taking the front of the motor off as well and have a look at the oil pump. So we'll pop this to the side as well. We'll flick on over and we'll just take the last bolt out of the windage tray here. And then we can see how it all ticks. No matter how much you clean one of these things, more oil just keeps on coming out of it. So it's not until it goes through like a hot wash bath that it's actually clean and you get rid of this horrible smell. The lower section of the LS is a Y block design and incorporates deep side skirts along with six bolt cross bolted main bearing caps. This is what the engineers at GM call a snap fit cross bolt design and it provides really good crankshaft and block rigidity. So the bottom end's pretty strong. We've got our ring gear on the back side here. Uh, one of the things that you don't often see is the trigger system. So this is a thing for the engine management system that tells the ECU how fast the engine is turning and at what position it's at. So here's all of the teeth that we're looking at around the outside here. The position sensor is this thing just here. So as the crankshaft turns around, these wheels turn around at the same rate and give us all the information. Stock bottom end of this thing, crankshaft, rods and pistons, the stock bottom end challenge for an LS is a big deal. These things are making 800 horsepower at the wheels comfortably on the stock bottom end. So all this stuff is very strong from the factory. Now this is about as far as we're going to go stripping the bottom end. We're not going to pull the mains and big end caps off, but I do want to take the front of the engine off, have a look at the oil pump assembly and have a look at the timing chain and gear setup. Now we've got the oil pump that's driven off the crankshaft. And we've got the cam gear, camshaft behind that, and the crank pulley behind here. So let's pull the oil pump off. Hopefully there's not too much oil left in it. Okay. Here we go. And this is one of the things, as a Nissan guy, this is one of the things that I love about the LS. Look at that drive how many edges, how many teeth it's got, basically into our oil pump here. So how this works, it's crank driven. So as this thing spins around, that compresses our oil, it picks it up through the pickup that we saw before in the sump, spits it out through the gallery and oil pressure into the engine. The collar that we've got here, there's so many edges for it to catch. Whereas say a Nissan RB, for example, has only got the two edges that rattle. That's one of the biggest problems with that engine. This engine definitely doesn't suffer from that. Further in here, we've got our cam gear, the bigger gear, and then our crank sprocket and our timing chain on the bottom here. A little bit loose because again, because we've got the push rods out, that's why the camshaft can move around a little bit in there. So normally that would be nice and tight. And that's all that's inside your LS engine. Not a lot, it's super simple. Not a whole lot of parts. There's not a huge amount of gaskets. I, I can really understand why people like these things. Well guys, we've got to the bottom of this engine, which means that we've got to the end of the episode. I hope you've enjoyed watching as much as I've enjoyed pulling this thing apart. If any of you guys have got an engine lying around at home that you'd like me to pull apart and destroy, by all means, give us a call and we'll organize it. But for now, I gotta figure out how to put this thing back together and send it back to war speed. See you next time.